Welcome back to another podcast episode where we help aspiring developers get jobs and junior developers grow. Today, we're actually going to be reviewing Full Stack Academy. And I actually did do a Full Stack Academy review before, but full transparency, it was with a good friend of mine, Ben. Um, and I've, I've told these lovely folks here about it, but he's a very kind person and it's very hard for him to be critical. <laughs> he always looks at the good in people. And so I felt like it might've been a little bit biased. And so I wanna go back to like, or I wanna go like transform that type of review into my new format where we invite three random people to give their perspectives on Full Stack Academy. So you get a 2021 Full Stack Academy review. But like usual, we'll go ahead and start with our intros. We'll go from left to right. If you want to uh, actually go ahead and mention, like if you were working a previous position, like a full-time position before you transferred into software engineering, people love to know about that. So mention your previous industry, kind of where you're at now. Um, and then, yeah, we'll do a quick 30 second intro. Nico, we'll start with you. Sounds good. Yeah, my name is Nico. Before coding, I was a music teacher. Um, this is kind of my calling and my passion. Um, I reached this level of teaching at a, a private high school slash middle school that was amazing. All the classes were one on one, but the pay just wasn't enough to support me living on my own. All the other teachers had spouses or roommates, and so um, or both. And um, I realized that I had to make a, a change in my career. And I tried a free coding course to see if I could do it. And I learned Python and kind of fell in love with coding. And I was coding all the time, uh, doing assignments for this really basic course, uh, just kind of teaching you the fundamentals. And then I talked to some developer friends, one of whom uh, took full stack and told me about the academy. And he was working as a dev at a small uh, dev shop. And he kind of convinced me to to dive in and, and apply. Uh, I went to a free um, kind of like course before just to kind of see what it was all about. This was right before quarantine in 2020. And uh, that was actually hosted by your friend, Ben, who you mentioned earlier, who, who was already on your podcast. And yeah, he is a really nice guy. Convinced me to apply. Uh, that day was the deadline. I applied that day and, and got into my, my cohort uh, that started in April. Awesome. All right. Uh, wait, when did you graduate? So yeah, it started in April, 2020. I graduated in uh, July of 2020. And um, I got my first uh, software engineering gig uh, in December of 2020. Okay. So yeah. That's recent. Congratulations. Yes. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, all right. Quick intro for me. Um, I was a software engineer for a few different companies for a few years. And then I decided I uh, built up enough savings. I quit my job to give myself a two-year runway and started my own company helping software engineers grow. And that's what I do. That's what I get to do full time. Um, so one, I think this video won't be released for maybe a few weeks. So this will be a little bit delayed, but everyone that's been watching, thank you so much. I just got partnered on YouTube because of all of you. I think I grew my viewership by uh, a thousand percent within three months um, since I started this new format. So. This is, uh, I'm really excited to continue this podcast because of that, that, um, yeah, yeah, I just, I'm, I'm just really excited, but thank you everyone. I really appreciate you watching. Um, and then I do want to include my background as well. Um, I was an aquatics director. I actually was an aquatics director and then I quit and I just did part-time lessons, teaching swim lessons to children for like two years while I was trying to become a developer. Um, very kind of a very odd route to becoming an engineer. And uh, I have a psychology degree, nothing engineering in my background whatsoever. So, um, all right, but Kelly, let's hear your story. Sure, so my name's Kaylee. Um, I, that's okay. <laughs> I, um, my very first um, kind of step into coding was actually a very, very long time ago. I started out in the mid nineties making websites for bands yeah. Um, and that was when JavaScript was born. Um, but 
we, myself and many of my friends that were doing the same thing, weren't really using anything that fancy yet. Uh, most of us were pretty much banging out some straight HTML. It was, it was rocking. Um, anyway, that doesn't really pay that much um, back then. So uh, I moved on to a career in hospitality, um, <clears throat> which I've done for the last uh, 20 plus odd years. Um, my most recent job before deciding to go to boot camp was as a general manager of a big uh, restaurant in New York City. Um, in my cohort, there was a lot of other uh, people who um, had also come from the hospitality um, industry. So, you know, bartenders, waitresses, managers, everything. So this is pretty common transition, I think. Um, I had made the decision to get out of the restaurant business before the pandemic had actually started, but just barely. <laughs> really just barely and then all of a sudden this hit and like everybody is doing stuff like this and i was like oh okay <laughs> well here we go um like nico i started out um first trying to self-teach um i started out le learning uh python myself and kind of going towards more of like a data bent um i kind of realized quickly that it wasn't gonna take me where I wanted to go as as quickly as as I as I wanted and um, a friend of mine who's uh, also a software engineer recommended that I apply for Grace Hopper and I was like cool let's do it do nothing else and I um, went on the website and the deadline was like already passed but they said they were still accepting applications and um, said you had to take the entrance entrance exam in JavaScript. And I was like, crap, I don't know JavaScript. So I learned JavaScript in three days and sent them the application and took the entrance exam and graduated from the Grace Hopper cohort in September 2020. Um, I, am, I do not have uh, a position yet. I'm still in the process of looking. So um, that's been my journey so far. Well, um, I'm sure it's it's upcoming and, and yeah, that's wow, that's super recent. I thought you had graduated in the middle of 2020, but um, you still huh. you definitely have time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not worried yet. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that's a good mindset. Yeah. How about you, Chidi? Did you lag out? I think she might be frozen. Oh, no. Okay, so oh. I guess I always... Sorry? Oh, there you are. Okay, you're good. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. <sighs> when I was younger, I used to like redesign like pages and things like that. Just using HTML, I guess CSS. It looked really different back then. But um anyway, I went to school, like in school I did do a bit of coding, like bioinformatics. Um, eventually, I ended up in admin, in the admin space for quite some time. And I just felt like there wasn't much growth there. And I wanted a more challenging role, something that wasn't as monotonous. And a software engineer friend of mine who actually um, went to App Academy hit me up and told me I should really consider going to App Academy um, and that was actually like, I learned Ruby and everything for the sake of like just passing, um, you know, their entrance exam, their coding challenge. Um, although I eventually, I did get in. However, at, during that period of time in which I was studying, I did discover Grace Hopper. And I like the idea. I just like certain things about Grace Hopper better than App Academy. So I also applied there. I actually took my... Um, coding challenge in Ruby, not JavaScript. I actually did not know JavaScript at the time I got accepted. And um, yeah, I guess, you know, the rest is history. I went into, I did the um, 2004, which is like 2020, the fourth month of the year, 2004 um, April cohort. I graduated in July and I got my first role in September. So that's where I'm at. Congrats on the new role. Would you be willing to call out the person that got you into coding? 
Yeah, I could definitely call him out. His name is Yummy. Um, okay. Yeah, he's he's a connection connect of mine. He's connected with me on LinkedIn. So if you ever wanted to reach out to him, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk. Awesome. Well, thanks, Yummy. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> um, okay, so... A couple things. Uh, we're going to dive into what I'd like to do is we'll dive into the application process, the curriculum, the instructors, and then the post grad job assistance or job search assistance. Um, Chidi, if you can, over the like the next minute, you're lagging a little bit. Can you see if any apps are updating on your side um, and just try to close everything that you can? Um, it, it's doable for now. I'm just wondering if you're going to lag out too badly. It was kind of hard to understand. Okay, um, I can definitely. Okay, that. let me close some heavy apps on my, on my computer. Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, all right, let's go ahead and jump right into it. What did everyone think of the application process? Yeah, I um, I could start. I, I applied in Python, so I'm I'm sorry, Kaylee, that they <laughs> made you learn JavaScript in three days. Um, sounds like you did well, though. Um, from what I rec recall, it wasn't like, um, wasn't like you had to, you had to solve these coding problems. It was like, you had to show that you were trying. It was like, it was like you had to, um, uh, pseudocode was, was encouraged. I remember Ben telling me and that, you know, just kind of showing that, you tried and that you you made honest attempts and that you were on the right track to things. I think that was more important than actually like solving um, solving each one. I remember afterwards being like, there's no way I got in and uh, Same. and being pretty scared, but it ended up working out. Yeah, my mine was was very same. I, I I really thought I didn't get in. Um, when, uh, like I said, I, you know, they had already started foundations for my cohort and I was a late, um, a late application. Uh, looking back, I don't know that they necessarily said they required the JavaScript, but me reading through everything in my panic, seeing that the whole thing was taught in JavaScript, I imagine my brain jumped to that. It actually never occurred to me that you could apply in another language until you guys just said that now, which is kind of funny. Um, but uh, yeah, going into the exam, you know, I said, I knew that I was going to be slow um, doing, you know, the code wars that they recommend that you start off with. I was, that was my issue. Like I could always solve the problem. I was just slow. And the entrance exam is a timed exam. So coming into it, that, that was my biggest fear. Um, it's definitely like, a great like gradiated exam starts out really easy and gets to the harder questions so kind of rolling through you start off with some of the easy ones and you know as they get progressively more difficult and time starts to run out i feel like that's when the panic kind of starts to set in and you know at a certain point you're just kind of like well I did the best that I could and that's that. And, you know, maybe the next cohort. And when I found out I got in, I was just shocked, absolutely shocked that, uh, that I had done enough. So, um, yeah. Okay. How about you, Chidi? Anything yeah. different? Anything different? Yeah. Uh, what was your experience like? Oh, my experience. Okay. Process? So, yeah. um, with regard to like, the entrance exam things like we had an entrance exam and then like there was like a coding interview did everyone have that mm -hmm. yep. okay, yeah. So, yeah i had a similar experience um i was like i don't know i'm there's no way i'm getting into this like i didn't complete all of it it wasn't you know it just wasn't right i ran out of time um and i wasn't too confident about it but again i think they really kind of wanted to assess out like what our levels were. Um, I don't think they expected us to complete it entirely. So I had a very similar experience and yeah, I was able to get an interview and we went forward. Okay. That's interesting because um, I took it maybe, what is it now? Like four or five years ago, something like that, but there was no entrance exam. 
It was just an interview, I think. There was an application, then an interview, and then a second interview if you didn't do so hot with the first one. Um, so it sounds like they changed some stuff up a little bit. Okay. All right. Sounds pretty typical. What do you think of the curriculum? You want to go in order again? or? <laughs> and I'm sure we, have, we all have thoughts on that. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I actually wish someone had, had kind of warned me that it'd, it'd be like trying to drink from a fire hose. We're trying to read read signs with your head hanging out of a car that's going two thousand miles an hour. Um, I didn't I didn't quite understand how fast paced uh, you know a boot camp would be. Um, that being said, Full Stack does a great job of teaching you kind of like the old way of doing things before teaching you the right way, which can be frustrating at first. Um, you're like struggling with basic DOM manipulation, and then you learn React or something. You're like, why did we even why did we even do that? And um, eventually you realize that in order to understand these these newer concepts you you really should build up some sort of foundation um of of what came before it so you know how it works um so i really like that uh kind of outline uh, that they use for the curriculum yeah it, that's one thing i really loved about full stack academy and when you're going through it you're like why i know i'm going to be learning react why am i using um, I don't know if they still did this, but you would like uh, build kind of a mini version of React with jQuery, and we were all wondering like, no, oh okay, but it, it did go jQuery one day for like a interesting very little bit. Yeah, we we were told jQuery is on its way out. We're not going to bother. So it is the the reason yeah. why we did it was kind of to uh, emphasize your perspective on that, Nico. There uh, with their strategy, you build so. With jQuery, you could basically manipulate the DOM a lot easier than with vanilla JavaScript. They had a lot of built-in functions, but you basically, we built React in to kind of realize like under the hood how it worked and how it refreshed this virtual DOM. And um, But they also like really emphasize jQuery's out the window as well. But I'm, I'm kind of... I'm kind of curious like what they replaced that with. So jQuery is just like one day um did you uh, i'm just going to be extra curious about this because this is my coding boot camp did you yeah. <laughs> like did you build like a basic version of react or like some form of like a, a virtual dom or anything like that i don't think so okay okay yeah, i remember doing dom manipulation like get element by you know class name etc it, it was like life. one one workshop or something that touched on it. Yeah, but that was it. Okay, sounds good. All right, please continue. All right, are you finished, Nico? Is it my turn? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, uh, I don't remember doing any jQuery. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I think our curriculum was probably very similar since we had cohorts um, right next to each other. Um, I agree with everything Nico said 100%. I would also like to add that um, and I don't know if this is necessarily Chidi's experience, but um, within Grace Hopper, um, we were a lot of high achieving uh, women <laughs> who are overachievers. And when you put them in a boot camp situation where they are, you know, trying to drink out of a fire hose to use Nico's analogy, um, they just want to actually drink the entire fire hose because of the overachiever nature of it. And there's a lot of conflict with that kind of work ethic going into a boot camp scenario where they're giving you way more than it's even possible to do. And I think um, that was really hard on a lot of the other um, the other women in, in my cohort. They, you know, every workshop, they, they tell you, like, you don't have to finish this, but you go into the workshop and or the lab and you're like, just driven to complete and, you know, check the boxes and do it. And um, I didn't have that problem so much. I was totally okay. I was, you know, okay, well, time's up. We didn't finish that one. That's done. You know, concepts is in my head. That's, that's enough. Um, you know, but for others, they would spend hours and hours after the day was over continuing to work on these workshops and, you know, finishing every single thing only to find out later that that's the last time they're ever going to touch any of that. And it really wasn't necessary for them to spend an additional eight hours of their evening, you know, focusing in on nailing down DOM manipulation or, 
you know, whatever. Um, so in hindsight, I, I wish that there would have been not so much for myself, but just as a, as, as a general group thing. I think that some of the women would have um, benefited a little more from having it kind of driven in that this is not, this is an introduction. This is not something that you need to know, you know, fully and completely. On the flip side, when we got towards the end where we were doing more of the data structures and, and algorithms, I wish we would have done a more thorough um, instruction on those things. I felt like coming out of it, you know, there was a lot of time spent on things that we're never ever going to use again and very little time spent on probably the most important interview <laughs> skill to have. Um, you know, coming out of, of the boot camp. So, um, but as far as the rest of the curriculum, I, I enjoyed it. I think a lot, I learned a lot. The instructors were awesome. Um, I, I'm glad that um, the process happened the way it did in an overarching sense. <clears throat> okay. I, I have two questions to that. Mm -hmm. uh, which one do I want to ask first? Um, do you, okay, so when I went through it, the second half of the curriculum, every morning, we would do uh, like a Reacto challenge. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you, you did that all the way through the second half? We did that all the way through the second half. Um, we had, um, I remember like the first lecture we had when we were kind of going over the base that, you know, like here's what a linked list is, here's what a tree is, here's what, like a lot of that got cut completely short. And we did maybe like out of the five that were listed in the works in the whole like workshop thing, we did like two of them that we covered in the lectures and they were like, oh, don't worry about it. You know, we'll skip through. And it was just, it was a very hurried process. Um, the checkpoint, actually, I think I, I did, like I got extra credit on the checkpoints. I got like 130% on the checkpoint, but like we didn't, dive into what it all meant. And so a lot of that, I, I didn't really ret retain so much until after I had graduated and I started studying for interviews on my own. And I went back to my checkpoint and was like, okay, all right, now this is all starting to kind of come together and make sense. Like the, the, what we were doing really was just too much of a skimmed overview. Um, for my taste. Um, and I feel like the majority of what I've learned in terms of those interview practices came after graduation for sure. Okay. That's really good feedback. Uh, the second portion is um, I mentored a few people from the Grace Hopper program and a couple, a uh, couple pieces of feedback I got from them were one, they felt, they felt like the, grace hopper program in the like the regular program they were uh they wish they had been in the regular program they felt like how the grace hopper program was managed um they just heard different feedback from their peers and they like some of it was like they didn't like an instructor and how they taught and they didn't really like how the program was managed um did you get any feel for that in the grace hopper program um, yeah, we, we had, uh, we had a lot of problems. Um, we definitely had an instructor that we, we had issues with. Um, we, our program lead was not present, um, was not receptive to our outreach to get help in dealing with the instructor that we were having issues with. Um, so we kind of definitely felt like we were kind of left in the dark um, and left on our own to fend for ourselves and, and figure it out. The main instructor was amazing. I cannot say enough good things um, about our, her, our lead instructor. Um, so the majority of, of our instruction came from the lead instructor, instructor and, and was high quality. It was just the interspersed parts with the second um, assistant instructor. Um, this is not really, you know, touching on the curriculum necessarily, but um, we had a lot of issues kind of like dealing with the administration when it comes to stuff like that. I don't necessarily feel like the curriculum itself was 
too much different. Like I didn't, I wasn't worried about my education being any different than had I taken the original program. Um, we did have a couple of students in our cohort that switched over to the regular program and out of Grace Hopper. Um, I haven't spoken to them directly to see what their, you know, experience was necessarily, but um, I haven't heard anything, you know, that it was so much more amazing. Um, from what I was told, it's like the exact same, you know, here's what you're doing this day, here's what you're doing the next day. Um, same with the project, same with everything. So, I mean, I guess in terms of your question, it would really come down to the difference being whichever actual instructor was chosen to lead that, you know, those particular cohorts. Cause I believe they switch them up from cohort to cohort. Okay. Wow. So, yeah. So. Judy, were you also in Grace Hopper? Yes, I was. What was your experience like? Okay, so um, I'll talk a bit about the curriculum um, as well. Uh, so I do think that their curriculum is pretty well chosen and up to date. One thing um, that I'm sure like they're probably changing right now is that we learn like class components when we were learning React. Whereas now it seems like hooks are more in vogue. So, um, but you know, I guess uh, curriculums can only evolve so quickly and boot camps are pretty good with that. Um, but yeah, I think that I love the fact that they kind of separate it into like six weeks of like junior phase and six weeks of senior phase. Whereas in junior phase, you're mostly learning um, the theory, well, you're learning theory and obviously application as well. You're being tested how much you retain the first week and we kind of learned the fundamentals like html css dom manipulation and then we go into like the three pillars right away of our stack and um you know we learn node we learn react we learn express um sequelize etc and upon finishing that portion we start to learn a bit of Redux. We're learning like, you know, what is a single page application um, and, you know, so on and so forth. And eventually we have to do a project at the end of junior phase and you have to pass that project in order to move on to senior phase. Senior phase consists of more of like project-based uh, learning and you are seeing what it means to kind of like work on a team and an engineering team where you are managing your project flow, you're using GitHub, you're learning how to manage merge conflicts, how to review code, et cetera. So it kind of feels more like you're working in a way because um, you're building, there's like a project that you're supposed to build um, by yourself. There's one project you're supposed to do by yourself, but there's three projects in total and two of which are in a group. So I think it was really, I, I think that was really good because again, you get the idea of like what it means to work with other people and how frustrating it could be and also how rewarding it can be. Um, but overall, I guess my experience was good. I would rate Grace Hopper pretty highly, but it wasn't perfect. There were definitely some some things that they can improve on like again like a program lead just wasn't really present as she should have been um i don't know if it had to do with covid i know everyone was going through it so um and that there was just i guess not always feeling supported by career by the career um department after graduation you know I felt like it was a lot of work for just one person. I think she was extremely industrious and a great worker and everything like that. But it's just it's just a lot of work for like one person to deal with like all of Grace Hopper alums. So yeah, overall it was good. It was good. Okay, and I whew, career is I probably had the most issues with Full Stack Academy with career. Um, in fact, our entire cohort did in the beginning and we just like my, our instructor got tired of us complaining and he finally like, you know, uh, 
I, I don't know what happened to her. I think she did transition to another position, um, but it was a terrible experience. And then it was a really, really good experience after that. They replaced her with someone that um, I loved interacting with. And she'd help me touch base like every week. Um, and she gave me really good advice. And I got a job within six weeks. Um, and, the, you know, this was like four years ago. Mark was a little less saturated too. But, um, and then it got really bad again. <laughs> so like my extreme experiences have always been with career. And I always think like it might be a high burnout job. They probably do put a lot on their career people. And I can see that. Um, but um it, I mean, it's, it's important that they get that right because you can learn education online. And the main reason you go to Full Stack Academy is to get that assistance, to get that job. And um, if they can't provide that and they can't provide a good experience with it, there are plenty of other cheaper coding boot camps with great curriculums that people should consider. Um, but that, yeah, that's my that was, that was a major source of the conflict in our cohort. Um, had a lot to do with uh, the entire career success department. Um, it wasn't the only source of conflict, but we we also had a lot of issues with that. <clears throat> Excuse me, in our group. So I definitely agree with everything uh, that Chidi has said. And you know, it's possible we even have the same same person, same everything. Who knows? <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Okay. I was wondering if I could bring up uh, something uh, Kaylee was talking about before, um, just about those workshops, about not finishing them. Um, the, I assume you're, t you're referring to the workshops that like you would start during the day and you would, you know, during the day you'd work on them with a partner. Um, one person would share their screen and they would type while the other person would kind of drive. Uh, it's called pair programming if you haven't heard of it. And then if you got really, really stuck, you were encouraged to reach out to like mentors that were just kind of waiting for help tickets to pop up and then they would kind of jump into the zoom room and help you but then uh you would just kind of work as far as you could until the end of the day and then it was like all right now if you have like your homework to work on go work on that type of a thing but um i actually really encourage if you can if you have the time and the energy to um students to go back and finish those projects and put them on your portfolio um, after after boot camp, yeah. <laughs> or in the boot camp if you can. Oh, um, <laughs> I, can. Yeah, I would I would push back on that a little bit. I think having a lot of brain time away um, during the boot camp because you're so overwhelmed that people just just trying to work through the night and not taking you know time away from the screen can be no, no, really no. overwhelming. <laughs> no, no, please sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> please, please take care of your body. Eat. Yeah. <laughs> you know start exercising um get uh you know there are a lot of home workouts um i started working out when i started full stack and i started taking naps during lunch and uh at the end of it i actually stopped drinking coffee um and i'm wow. been caffeine free since but uh yeah if you can do those workshops they will look good on your resume and compared to some other boot camp grads um you might be surprised at how, how, how much work you've actually done graduating from full stack. Um, I think other, you know, uh, other boot camps are, are great. I've, I've watched a lot of Don's videos, um, but a few of them, they don't have uh, as, as many projects that they do. Um, okay. You made a lot of good points and I'm going to distract us for a second um, from all the good points that you made. Do, am I the only one that hates home workouts? Like, I cannot get into it. I miss gym so much. Am I the only one? I'm not a fan. Like, if I'm following a video, like if I'm watching YouTube okay. or something, following along, I can do it. Yeah, the, the videos that I'm, I'm talking about. Yeah, no, I, I definitely cheat if I'm home and there's nobody to be accountable towards. When I had it before COVID, I had a trainer that was just a couple blocks down from me and, you know, he would call me and be like, beer, 20 minutes. <laughs> and that, that was, that was the best, like having somebody else to push you. Um, and at home, you don't. So I have my roommate. That. So that's probably why too. Ooh. I have somebody yeah. holding me accountable. That's good. That's really yeah. good. I do not have that. So <laughs> jealous. <Yeah. laughs> okay. You, you can like have a friend, like kind of hold you accountable. Yeah, yeah, my friends are just as lazy as I am, so, you know. 
<laughs> or we know how loud social media can be. You can be bold and just like make a LinkedIn post about your New Year's resolution and make sure people are accountable for you if you don't hit it. That's like a very extreme, but that's accountability. That's what yeah. version of. I think my friends would like call the, the, you know, kidnapping department at NYPD and wonder if something happened to me. <laughs> okay. So we'll, we won't do that. Yeah. Um, so let's see a couple things. Uh, Kaylee, it sounds like you were very conscientious of this overworking and you saw how it was impacting your cohort. And I do feel like, there are just some personalities, some people where um, it's very easy for them to burn out. And it's, most of it is because they're extra critical of themselves. Like you said, like a lot of overachievers usually are pretty critical of themselves. And I'm, I'm someone like that as well. I'm very, very critical of myself. And I, I've had to work on this for years. Um, but there are there is an advantage with what Nico said you know, like, of course, take care of your body, take like get sleep, eat healthy, work out. But also a lot of the extra uh, curriculum, like the bonus objectives, they are incredibly helpful. And they I've actually seen a lot of the bonus objectives that full stack has put out. It helps reinforce a lot of the concepts. So if you are like mentally ready like you don't actually need a, a hard break from that day, I highly encourage you to push forward with it um, because it will help reinforce the concepts by the end of the, the full program. Um, and if you aren't, like if you feel like you just you just need that extra break, like it is too much of a fire hose and you're like, if you're doing the extra work and you're not retaining it, that's not helpful. That's not constructive at all. And if you notice that, like you give it a try, um, you could like all the bonus objectives. I highly encourage all full stack alumni complete them afterwards, like go through it. It'll help you reinforce everything. Um, and then obviously, say, like, sorry to interrupt, but I was going to say you could go back at any, yeah. at any point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, when you are enrolled in full stack, you have access to your work workshops forever. Um, at least that's what they told us. So, you know, going back, going back and having those resources and, and reinforcing that learning has, has been a hundred percent helpful and useful. Um, I think kind of where I was coming from, from my original statement with that is that I think that, um, people get very lost in being focused and they lose perspective on what they're working on and taking a step back is the most successful like learning tool that I've had throughout any of the process, you know, um, in the whole tech world at large, everybody talks about having your rubber duck, you know, somebody to bounce stuff off of. And, you know, for me, it was, I would just leave my, my workstations in my room. I would leave my room and, walk around the apartment and just rattle off nonsense to my roommate. And she, she's like, I have no idea what we're talking about. I'm like, that's okay. You're just there. <laughs> and, you know, it's just being away from it is the thing. And even, you know, when that didn't work, I'd stop and cook dinner or take a shower or just like not working straight through all the time and, you know, making that your only thing that you're doing. And, I'm, I was personally more somebody who would get up early and work in the morning rather than working straight through the night. That was just my like productivity schedule. And when I would get up in the morning, everything that I was stuck on the day before would just kind of like fall into place the next day. And it was taking that, that break and like your brain needs time to sort itself out that's how it learns and draws the connections and, you know, makes you remember things. And, you know, if, if you can take that time to let your brain actually cement what you've learned in, I think that there's a, a lot of um, positive reinforcement in that for, for the learning process. I've experienced okay. that phenomenon as well. Yeah. I was yeah. wondering if Chidi, have you felt that too? Uh, yeah, definitely. I think that one thing, a couple of things, enable me to be pretty successful in the program i honestly think that two different people can have two completely different experiences in terms of challenge in that program you can really get by just kind of you know doing what you can in each work workshop it's not like if you don't finish it you won't be passed along it's fine what really determines if you pass at the end of the day is going to be um I think like the senior checkpoint and then the junior phase final project. So 
I think it is worthwhile, like after class, if you could spend an hour kind of trying to finish up your workshop or maybe do some of the bonuses. I think that's what I pretty much did. I would take maybe like an hour more, hour, hour and a half tops. I, I would never compromise my sleep. But even throughout the day as I'm working, you know, I would make sure to take a lot of breaks. I definitely believe that you have to um, switch from that like focused learning to like more diffuse learning where you kind of just let things like start to take form as you're taking a break. And the Pomodoro was like an amazing tool and help in allowing me to be able to just hold myself accountable and take breaks and kind of let that learning process take place. Um, I think like learning how to learn is a course on Coursera that I did complete prior to um, doing, you know, 2004 um, cohort because, and I would just go back to the notes I wrote a lot of the times. And it just kind of, again, like just reminded me that learning is a process and you cannot rush it. And yes, there will be times you think you're a wizard. There will be times you will question if someone dropped you on your head as a, as a child, you would, you will question yourself. You will not be sure of yourself. It's all normal. It's all part of the process and it will forever be the process as you're signing up to be in a career where learning is the objective and solving problems is the objective and there's no straight line from A to B, you know? So I just tried to keep those principles in mind and it kind of enabled me to be successful. I think that's really good advice. Uh, okay. I, I'd love to I actually had a couple questions, but we got to continue moving forward. Time has passed uh, really fast. Actually. Uh, one question I had though was CSS has always been weak. And I think uh, in the curriculum itself, usually you don't touch on it much. And a lot of people give feedback that they wish full stack would have dedicated at least an extra day, one, well, one to two days on CSS. They feel like they have to go back and learn those fundamentals with CSS once they actually graduate. Do you feel like, because you don't really know what, how the curriculum was before, but did you feel comfortable with CSS when you came out of the program to be confident in all front end positions? Not at all. Not I, at all. Um, I, I would agree. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> I was just saying I'm agree. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just, we just knew the basics, like you know, a selector and just kind of like how to move divs around, you know, center, align, a little bit of flex box, but it they gave us enough to be able to grow that knowledge, which I think was their intention. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've talked about this, but Full Stack Academy does a really good job of preparing you to be a back end software engineer or just a software like a full stack software engineer in general. And um, I mean, I, you know, like people have challenged me to answer the question like, well, what else could they sacrifice from their program? And it, I really can't make that decision. I think they made the right decision to. Um, like you said, uh, Chidi, like build on the fundamental. They teach you the fundamentals so you can build off of that and supplement that when you come out. Um, but I think like one thing I really want to emphasize for people, because it sounds like it's still pretty similar with the ratio of what they teach CSS to JavaScript, um, supplement the CSS. My very first position that I got within six weeks was very CSS heavy. And you don't know the type of front end position that you're going to get. And, you know, I've probably, you know, I don't know how many people I've interviewed from coding boot camps, but um, in 2020 going into 2021, it sounds like it's still much easier to get a front end position. So you still want to be marketable for that front end position. Um, you know, I might be wrong on that, but you know, that's a lot of the feedback that I've been getting. So uh, would a good piece of advice be to supplement that CSS knowledge when you come out? Or do you feel like that really didn't matter in any of your interviews? For me, I, I think I um, focused a, a good amount on it while I was in the boot camp just to make my, my projects look good. Um, my Grace Shopper, which is uh, um, a group project that's a um, e-commerce website. It's your first group project. Um, so you kind of have a, a bit of a skeleton for that. And then for our, uh, my senior capstone, my, my team uh, made a, a kind of like a beat making website. And um, we wanted it to look good. Um, so we spent a lot of time on the CSS. It, 
we definitely weren't, you know, doing, th there was that uh, one developer who made the painting, um, the girl with the pearl earring with just CSS. Um, and, it, you know, we did we obviously couldn't do something like that as uh, from bootcamp, but it's full stack academy. It's not, you know, CSS academy. So, um, and that's something that I think there's quite good documentation for and, and free materials for teaching yourself. So yeah, I think supplementing that outside of the bootcamp is, um, is a good route. Okay. I would echo basically um, what everybody else said. Uh, I It didn't really bother me um, not knowing too much about the CSS coming. My interview, I mean, I have a job yet, but the, all of the interviews I've had so far, none of them have even mentioned CSS even once. Everything's been, you know, straight data structures and algorithms. Um, but I did, my first goal after graduating was to finish my profile site. So my personal website, I spent a lot of time um, kind of teaching myself a little more of the CSS to, to make that pretty or, <laughs> or a little bit not so horrible to look at. Um, and I think that, you know, while it was kind of a struggle that having at least touched on like, I think everybody hated flex <laughs> across the board, um, but coming back to it, um, it felt a little bit less evil and I was able to, you know, successfully implement that pretty easily, you know, with just the foundation that we had um, during the course of the boot camp. Okay. Sounds pretty good. Uh, Chidi, do you have anything extra to add to it? Um, I would say as a software engineer or even a full stack software engineer, if you were to learn CSS, like even to take like time to take a Udemy course, you'd, you'd be head and shoulders above everyone else because a lot of software engineers do not know CSS very well. And I think that you will um, set yourself apart and you'd be very marketable in that, in that sense. And I think it's, it's a bit undervalued, but um that's the difference between your app looking nice and looking terrible. So it is. Right. Yeah. Appearances are everything. And i like that you emphasize you're going to be very competitive. Most people dodge it. They don't want to learn it. They kind of avoid it like the plague, um, especially people that are going to full stack uh, programs. Okay. What do you think of your instructors? If, if my instructors uh, were just permanent full stack employees, I would give full stack a 10 out of 10 review to anybody who asked me and tell them that they would love it and that they should sign up right away. Um, sadly, two of them left uh, as I was entering senior phase. And more and, have left since. And more have left since. Um, almost all of them. So it's, yeah. it's kind of hard to uh, say that it matters. But yeah, I've, I've loved... I guess, I guess it, it mattered a lot to me, but like for someone who's thinking about signing up, um, it's kind of hard for me to recommend the program because I don't know who's going to be teaching it now. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, this is public knowledge, so it's not me um, saying anything, but uh, Full Stack has been acquired um, by another educational company. And um, that was in 2019. So all of us kind of were in full stack when this was happening. Um, but from what I understand, a lot of the transitions are really only now kind of taking place. So, you know, any, any future cohorts are probably gonna experience some different things than we did because of that. Um, so there, there has been some in issues and controversy over some of the new changes coming about. Um, and I think that was probably a big source of, of the pushback we got um, with the issues that my cohort had, um, you know, it was different people in charge. So, and in the middle of a transition, so the reluctance to deal with it was was pretty apparent, um, you know, but uh, now that they're mostly fully transitioned through to the parent company, I, you know, I don't know what the... <laughs> yeah, I'm, so I... <sighs> Yeah, I've, I've known that for some time. Um, I just asked not to say anything, 
So I actually didn't even realize it was public knowledge at this point. So now... Yeah, you can Google it. It's all over. Now I know. Okay. Now I can talk about it more. Um, I think the people that I talked about it with at Full Stack Academy, we were really curious how that would affect Full Stack Academy. And our our perspective was just give it time. And uh, the, the sad thing is um, when I come... Like Full Stack Academy, I have such respect for Full Stack Academy and what David created. Um, oh, sorry. Who's the other co-founder Nimit. of it? Nimit. Nimit. Yeah, David and Nimit created... I I don't know. I was kind of sad to hear that it was required um, or acquired. It was just so many changes can happen. Like my first company was acquired and like 95% of the staff, they got uh, booted. They got fired. Um, and I, I feel like, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like someone like David or Nimit in their position, they, they do have to be very careful about like how much pushback they give when they still hold their position of a company that they sold. Um, it's, a, it's a really tough position to be in. But, you know, it sounds like they're starting to stabilize a little bit from uh, Kaylee, kind of what you mentioned. So I really do hope it goes well and Full Stack Academy continues to have rigorous interviews and they continue to produce really solid software engineers and they, they land positions. I'm, I'm really wishing the best for them. But um, yeah, I remember when I was told that. I can give you a little insight um, as to what happened after um, Kaylee's uh, cohort and, and ours, the 2004 kids. Um, they combined um, the online, obviously everything that is currently online, um, they combined the Chicago and New York campuses into one cohort. Um, and they, with all the teachers that left, they needed to do some hiring and it didn't really seem like they did that. So um, kind of like with the career situation, some people were spread a little bit too thin. And uh, the class size was was gigantic. And I guess uh, Kaylee and I were talking a little bit before the Zoom. Uh, we were both in small cohorts, but uh, she was like, yeah, my, my cohort was abnormally small. We had 24 people. And I was like, oh, mine was nine. Yeah, wow. So okay. um, with, with those numbers, you know, you really get to form close bonds with people um, and get to uh, form close relationships. I'll be friends with some of the people in my cohort for the rest of my life. Um, and we all check in with each other. Um, and that was the experience that I was looking for in, in an in-person um, uh, boot camp. I, that's what I signed up for initially, at least, was to be able to network with people, you know, go out to lunch together or something like that. But obviously, we couldn't do everything um, once we were forced to stay online, which obviously I'm, I'm happy we did, but uh, it, it ended up working out. But um, with those giant classes, I, I don't really know how well um you can do that and i'd also kind of like to add to that i'm sorry chidi um with the, the that transition of combining and having the the bigger classrooms and everything going remote and so on and so forth they have um changed the pricing structures also and that was also a source of strife um within our group because you know we felt like some of the benefits that Nico mentioned of being, you know, on site together and, you know, full stack pay. I don't know if you guys had, you know, happy hours or, you know, social events, all these things were, were part of what we were sold as the whole product of, of the, the program. And we didn't get any of those things. We also had to buy a lot of our own equipment and, you know, basically set up our entire home offices after also paying, you know, this full giant tuition and not getting anything else in return for it. Um, and, you know, kind of expressing those frustrations and, you know, trying to get any sort of, you know, answer from them and feedback on like help, you know, like help us, you know, what can I do to help you help us? Or what, you know, what is it that we can do that makes this product that you sold to us as a boot camp make us feel like we are getting, you know, everything that we intended. And, you know, I, I can never fault them for everything going remote. Like that's, that's just what happened. I can't fault them, you know, for making that choice to have 
everything be online. And, you know, I'm grateful that they had the infrastructure built in where that transition was easy for the cohorts that had done both and, you know, easy for us. We were the first full-time cohort from my understanding um, or the second, I guess. Uh, I just, I just feel like there could have been more recognition on their part of the struggles that we were going through considering what we were expecting um, and they could have done more to address that. <clears throat> I think you bring up some really good points. Yeah. How about you, Chidi? What, uh, what do you think of the instructors? I thought the instructors were pretty quality. Um, I think you're muffled a little bit. The audio, you hear me? Yeah, now yeah. I can. I um, I said I thought that the instructors were pretty good. Um, some were stronger than others. Um, there, I believe, like there was one in particular with whom I had a problem with. But beyond that, I think for the most part they were pretty good. Um, again, I we all have our favorites, and you could really see like how some people shine um, above others. Um, but. I would say that they were pretty much there with us. Like we were able to, I think we had like two instructors for junior phase. And then we had one main instructor for senior phase and then like a part-time instructor. So, and there's, mind you, there's 34 of us. So I think the two for 34 was like, okay, but still stretching it. And when we had just like one for senior phase and then like the part-time instructor, I think like things got kind of were going by the wayside and the instructors were kind of, they were stretched thin because they were jumping from class to class and being able to advise us for our senior projects. It, you could tell like they weren't, you know, all the way as productive as they could be if they just had less of a load. I think honestly, what I peeped after we, after everything went um, virtual was that I felt like full stack was just, it became more profit driven in a way. Like, I guess they realized that, hey, we can pretty much have anyone apply now. They don't have to be in New York or Chicago. And you know, preferably because I guess the career um, success team are mostly based there, but yeah, they don't have to be in one place. It could literally be anywhere and we can now like scale. So I thought from what I saw that maybe they let some things go by the wayside as like the cohorts continued because I had, did have a coffee chat with someone from 2006 or, and she pretty much mentioned that what we got was like amazing compared to what they got. And I, that was very disappointing. I, their launch day I heard was not good. I think they only had like one or two companies that they met with or just one. We had five. Yeah. I'm sorry. We had five total, five but, total, but, total but most but of like them, we most of them were them. hiring. Yeah. But they changed, they changed yeah, the launch so. day format. Um, they're not doing launch day anymore. Now they're doing like a Q and A session that's grouped in with everybody as a whole. So you can sign up for the Q and A session and be in there with another 50 people and watch a presentation and that's it. There's no more launch day. Yeah, that was weird. So, you know, I heard that and I, I was pretty disappointed cause launch day was kind of a big deal. And we had maybe, I want to say like 15 people and I met with like, like four people in total that day. So, that's a big deal, especially when you're beginning your your interview process. You want to get that practice. And Full Stack did kind of promise that. And I'm, I'm kind of sorry to see that they are putting, like, scaling before the quality of the education. Because I think that's what sets their grads apart. I got my job through launch day. Nice. So, nice. Yeah, it, it really hurt to hear that. Um, yeah. The, go ahead, Kaylee. I, I was just going to say that I had two face-to-face -face for my launch day, um, and it was the following cohort that um, officially switched to the Q&A format. Um, we complained a lot 
um, like a lot, a lot. We had like a, um, an AMA with David and Nimit on graduation day where we really had, um, I don't know if they knew they were walking into really and asked me anything, um, but we, we kind of had it out as, uh, and it was not just our cohort. It was, I know, heard about this. Yeah. yeah. I heard about it too. Yeah. yeah. Famous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, we kind of had it out with them and, you know, I think that we were just coming from a place of like feeling left behind and that, that, that it needed to be addressed. And, you know, they're like, we just wanted them to agree to maybe like, okay, if this is pandemic related, fine, I can live with that, but give us another launch day later down the line or, you know, give us something like, let's talk about it. Let's have a discussion. Let's, you know, address these concerns. And it was just kind of really shut down. And after, you know, the conversation with David and Nimit, you know, we were offered a second launch day um, only to find out that Chicago only got um, a second launch day and New York got a Q&A session that was horrible. <laughs> it was not not a great experience, the Q&A session. Sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but like, <laughs> terrible. Yeah, oh. it, was, it was very disappointing. And, you know, at that point, I think, um, you know, not everybody knows this, but Grace Hopper um, is a pay when you get hired program if you choose. I personally paid up front. I, you know, had the means, fortunately, to do that and didn't want to be beholden, you know, to certain things. And coming out of it, um, many of the other students found ways to figure out how to pay so they wouldn't be beholden to anything because so much of it was a poop show um kind of a try not to cuss uh, was you know just the career success and everything that they had to be accountable towards just wasn't useful to them and wasn't going anywhere and you know having to check in and report for nothing and just just became not worth it to to a lot of people so they yeah. they found they found ways to pay so they could move on with their lives and now there's an isa for okay. anyone yeah okay. it's mm. not just to benefit it's not just grace hopper anyone can, grace can choose hopper? to pay once they get a uh interesting defer p- defer the majority of the payment you still have to make a, a deposit two thousand yeah. dollars um but you don't have to pay the tuition until after you're hired and that's yeah that's um, something that they offer to anyone now. And uh, yeah, I, it was my understanding that that was kind of like the draw in for, from Grace Hopper and what made it so awesome. Um, well, you're kind of sold this idea that they're helping the underrepresented populations to get them into tech only to find out, A, you find out you're paying more than anybody else did because the tuition is higher for Grace Hopper than for the regular full stack academy doing that since i paid up front i got to pay the regular full stack tuition so mine was less wait it's higher if if you defer and grace hopper right yep if you defer i think is reasonable four thousand four thousand dollars which is why i chose to because i was like i that's that's a lot of interest on a pretty small Oh, because loan. of the interest. Okay. That makes you know, sense. This is basically what it is, is interest. Or, you know, weighing if you don't get a job in a year, you don't have to pay um any what? tuition for Grace Hopper. I don't know if that's true for, for the full stack. Um, I would understand interest with a, a loan from a bank, but they don't they- call it that. That's just what the price is. But. Yeah. I, I guess like if you do want to pay up front, you can. Um, and pay the lower price. But if you don't have it, which I, I didn't have it, so <laughs> I did the 3000 down and I'm paying it off now as I'm working. Yeah, I was very fortunate. Not gonna lie. <laughs> okay. Um, shoot, we don't have, okay, we have 13 minutes. I, I, I have so much to say. Um, okay, so first of all, this like, part one now. Part two, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like I really love Full Stack Academy. The reason why I love it so much is because of the experience. It's because of the happy hours. It's because of like being able to connect with my instructors and the students on a deeper level, which is so hard to do on remote. And Full Stack Academy, this isn't against you guys. Um, this is against anyone offering a remote program. Almost everyone, they 
they wish they would have gone to the immersive and they go to the remote because that's really one of the only options for them. Um, so once COVID, we finally get a handle on COVID, like I highly suggest you choose an immersive option for any coding bootcamp. It just makes a huge difference. Um, with that said, it sounds like the transition to remote, they really... I, I, it sounds like their curriculum is still solid. I mean, they've probably been improving it. I have a lot of faith in their curriculum. Um, really, the only thing I have against it was the lack of CSS knowledge, but that's it. I mean, and I'm a very critical person. Um, so the curriculum is solid, but they really dropped the ball in that remote program. And a lot of it, it, it sounds like some of the choices that they've been making um, – they're going to make, I, I would love to see their financials. I really would. I would love to see like what happened when they opened it up to everyone in the world. Um, I, I think part of, part of why I promoted Full Stack Academy so much was like the rigorous interview process, which I hear has gotten easier. And they just made sure everyone was on the same level before they started. Even like everyone could join, just like do a little extra pre-work if you need to. And everyone, like when everyone's on the same level, um, you don't have this like huge skill gap and have to like cater the course towards people that need to catch up. And that's what has to happen with education programs with a big skill gap. Um, so it's still kind of like that. Sorry to it? interrupt. Someone from my uh, boot camp actually chose to stay back so that she could, uh, you know, go over the junior phase again. And someone else was actually held back um, and not allowed to progress, which is why I ended up graduating with, with eight other people. Do you... Oh, so you're saying that they are still strict with like narrowing that skill gap? Yeah, like, um, and if anyone's wondering, you know, you don't have to pay to redo anything. You can defer um, for a certain amount of time. But yeah, they were making sure that everyone was on the same page before progressing okay. to senior phase, for sure. Yeah, before senior phase. That's we had promising. a similar, similar experience. You had to pass the checkpoints and do everything before you were allowed to progress. Okay. I think... Um, I think they're pretty hard on that. I would actually encourage them to go back to their old interview process, which was much harder um, because I, I think it's that first six months where people are doing a lot of pair programming. Yeah, you're doing groups in the second half, but the pair programming is where I got the feedback um, where there was a huge skill gap. Um, so I, I think that's where I'm focused on, but it, it sounds like they still care about that. They want everyone to be on the same level. So I maybe think there was noticeable skill gaps in junior phase. Okay. I think there were noticeable ones. And then even like the margin to pass the senior phase, I don't like, isn't crazy high, you know? So people do pass and still struggle. Okay. That's good yeah. to know. I, I was so, going to say there is a skill gap. And then at some point everyone would have like this click, mm -hmm. but it yeah. was, it was delayed. It was like one person would click in junior phase. One person would click in senior phase, but everyone would eventually it was like things fall into place but i could see how you're saying like everyone's starting together so they all you're already kind of in sync would would be a better experience okay i i see what you're saying i i think like i'm just going to say a message to full stack academy because i know staff from there i'm going to listen um you have a great program and you're dropping the ball on it i understand the situation that we've been delivered but um like instructors are like the quality of instruction um, in the retention of the instructors themselves. That's going to be a huge challenge when you have a company buying you out and you need to figure out a solution for that because that's what makes or breaks your coding boot camp. It's like, it's so huge. And every good experience I've had is because they had great instructors. They had supportive instructors, supportive staff. They took in feedback all the time and they took it seriously and showed you that they actually applied the feedback. And when you had that big Q and a session uh, with David and Nimit, it sounds like they didn't really show you that they cared about your feedback and actually applied things that were reasonable. And I mean, sometimes you just can't apply that feedback. It doesn't make sense for the business, but, but being transparent in making like at least telling you why they didn't apply this feedback, like being as transparent as possible is something uh, Full Stack Academy, they've done really well. It sounds like up until kind of the past couple of years. Um, I'm like, I'm being extra critical because I definitely believe in the curriculum. I, I know a lot of staff that work there. It's a beautiful program. I want to see it thrive and be successful. Um, but it sounds like they do have a few kinks with this transition that they really need to iron out. And I hope they start taking the feedback seriously because I, I do want to see this program successful. 
I mean, all of that being said, I, 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 I think I could say I would go back and do it again. Like, even though there's a lot of things I'm really upset about and things that didn't get addressed and things that weren't going the way I, I still think I would do it again. I think that just now being aware more of where those weaknesses are, it's going into it with clear eyes and knowing, really knowing what I have to actually do myself more and knowing what I'm going to get from them. You know, like I definitely went in thinking there would be bigger support from career success and there's not, you know, coming out of it and realizing now how important data structures and algorithms are for the interview process. You know, I would have definitely spent a lot more time focusing in depth on, on those things, you know, um, if I were to do it again. But the, I would say the overall experience was positive and positive enough that I, I would do it again. That's and, good. That's I definitely good. Say, like for me, I would definitely do it again. I mean, both that changed my life at the end of the day. I went from doing something like pretty basic to doing something I really enjoy and I didn't do it. It didn't take that much time, which is great. So I'm more of a self-starter anyway. So like even with the career process, I never did any of those like check-in things. <laughs> I never did that. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I would see it every week and I'm like, I have no time for this. I just kind of had my own process and I just got it done, you know, but yeah. And I would also recommend it. You just kind of have to know what to expect Actually, I'm not sure if I would recommend it now, knowing like what's going on. But for what I went through, I would totally recommend that um, experience to anyone. So. And if I could kind of, sorry, Nico, if you had something to say, but I just want to touch on something that Chidi said about um, the career success. I, f I feel like it also kind of depends on where in your life you're at when you come into this program. You know, I had a full, complete career um, you know, I'm in my 40s and doing a big major life transition. So, you know, this like intro to interviewing and stuff was kind of not really for me. And a lot of those support services that are geared towards younger people in the start of their careers, even those transitioning, they're still, they haven't had as much interview experience. You know, I was a boss, I interviewed people, um, you know, coming at it from all different angles versus somebody who really has no idea what's going on. The career success was very angled towards a very, very 101 um, aspect. And, you know, I think that, that maybe some variety in that that's geared towards, you know, people who have a different life experience with it would have been useful. Um, that's yeah. really unfortunate. I, I in a in a past life hired other people as well, but the career um, support that I got from from Trent Rhodes, shout out to Trent, um, helped me immensely. Um, he helped me negotiate um, my first salary. Um, I actually got a job after um, full stack in tech, but not as a software engineer. I was a, a um, database administrator, but really the title should have been CRM administrator. Um, and he helped me so much with that, uh, through LinkedIn. I posted a meme on LinkedIn about the job market and a friend saw it and was like, Hey, saw your post. Do you want me to, do you want me to, um, you know, put your name in a hat for this role? It, it might involve some sequel. And, um, that was really cool. Um, if it wasn't for Trent, I wouldn't have been using LinkedIn and I, I wouldn't have been, uh, I wouldn't have been prepared for those interviews. Um, so I, I really like the support that I got um, for career success. And I really like the support I got from alumni um, who would like proactively try to help. They'd be like, let's chat during lunch. I have an hour. And they would be working in software engineering and they would just want to help me get a job because they were full stack grads. And they're like, hey, I heard that, you know, the program's been changing a lot, but I want to make sure that you get um, some good help, just like I did just pay it forward. And I had a coffee chat yesterday with someone and, uh, it, it's just kind of this amazing community that, um, I hope can thrive despite all of these, um, current, um, issues that we all know about. Yeah. 
I, I and I think that's a good thing to end with. We literally have two minutes. Um, I'm getting worse and worse at not breaking my promise with ending this on time. But um, like, I, I think a final piece of this really is um, this is a window into what's happening during COVID nineteen, and this is I, I think it's very realistic to see a recovery after we get settled and after i mean the economy is going to take a, a long time to start recovering but um you know this is the first step and I, I think we can see full stack recover the how they go about executing you know this really good curriculum how they go about hiring instructors and being able to retain them and you know like really holding career staff accountable because like you know nico that I had a, a similar experience uh, with a career success person that you did. And, um, you know, I've had awful ones as well. So there's inconsistencies and I think there needs to be more accountability. And I, I know I have some insight into why that is because I've talked to some people. But um, what I'm trying to say is like after COVID-19, I think they have a real solid chance of recovering and being a really good program, a really solid program. And I think they still are. I just... I think we all would love to see them like just get back on the horse and like deliver the experience that they promised everyone. Um, and I think they can still do that. And so hopefully we do see that once we get out of COVID territory, but that's it. Okay. We got to end it here. I love this conversation. It was definitely a pleasure meeting all of you. Um, let's do our outros. If you are building an app or your company's hiring, anything like that, feel free to shout yourself out. Um, but usually I kind of just go around and ask how people can get a hold of you. Um, so Nico, if people want to reach out to you, where could they find you? Yeah, uh, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, it's N Sward, S-W-A-R-D. I think my company is going through some growth right now. I work at Red Foundry, a, a mobile development company in Chicago. and. Um, it's great. We focus on React Native. Awesome. Um, all right. For me, uh, if you if you've considered Full Stack Academy or you've gone through it and you have your own opinions, share it in the comments below. I want to hear it. Hundred percent. I want to. I want to hear different perspectives on this. Like I said, Full Stack Academy is a place that I came from, and it's a place that I care about because they, um, you know, Chidi, as you mentioned, they changed my entire life um, for the better. So. Leave comments below. It also helps my videos out. Please share this podcast as we're still trying to grow. Um, but yeah, how about you, Kaylee? Um, you could reach me also on LinkedIn, uh, Kaylee, K-A-L-I dash N-F-N, or um, I have a profile site at Kaylee, K-A-L-I dot N-Y-C. You can reach me there. I don't have a job. I'm looking to interview, so I'm available. Awesome, Kaylee. Um, and uh yeah, so what I'm actually going to do, I I don't even know how many recruiters are hiring. I I built up quite a list, but what I like to do is put LinkedIn profiles in the actual post uh, so people can reach out to you if they want to do that. Is that all right? Beautiful. Love it. Right. Okay, cool. How about you, Chidi? Yeah, um, I'm currently working um, at a company called Within. They are a performance branding slash marketing firm, and... Um, I can be reached at what Chidi said on Twitter. And also I, I um yeah, you know, my LinkedIn will be down below. So hit me up. All right, sounds good. Uh stick around for a few minutes after the episode, but Nico, Kaylee, Chidi, thank you so much for hopping on. It's a pleasure catching up, uh, especially with this being full stack. Thank you. Thank you. Just see everything we believe. We just see